So welcome back to the first case for this week of February Friday. In this case, we are going to my home state, you know, the lovely Texas. Um, this city we were covering in particular, we are going to Clear Lake, Texas, which I didn't even know was like a thing. And apparently it's like within an hour drive of Houston. But somehow like I didn't know about this case, so I researched it. Uh, I knew about the case like for a while, but I didn't know it took place. Oh, I know it took place in Texas, but I didn't know it took place in Clear Lake, Texas. That makes sense. So anyway, let me quit my rambling. There's a lot to unpack. And let's get started. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, maybe you'll get sick of being the monster out of my head, under my bed. Think you're something out of my nightmares. Stay me right there. But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead, then will you get bored of killing me? So of course, guys, start with the killer. Um, Christina Marie Palillo was born on March 31st, 1986 in Long Island, New York. Her father was a construction worker and he sadly died when she was two years old. He, I guess, did think ahead because, you know, construction is like very dangerous. He had a life insurance policy and she was the beneficiary, but she was not allowed to touch it until she was 18. I remember I said she's two. And the mom couldn't, like, go through, like, a loophole and touch it either. And apparently she, the mom would go through financial struggles. She would start doing drugs. She does have a sibling named John, but John, understandably, does not want to associate with Christine after what she did years later. So then, of course, Lori starts getting into drugs. Um, and so Christine and I assume John was going to live with relatives while the mother was dealing with her drug issues. Well, Christine would start to suffer alopecia, where basically she's, like, losing hair and is at the age of five. So she's going through a lot. Dad died, mom's on drugs. I'm living with relatives because mom's on said drugs. Well, kids, of course, are going to make fun of her because this is like kindergarten. And she would wear a wig because also, you know, like, hair is like really important to women. And, of course, you know, kids are little shit, so they're going to snatch the wigs off, you know, and make fun of her regardless. And so to make it even worse, um, Christine had really bad vision and had to wear, like, these bottle, bottle cap glasses, which apparently that's what they're... That's what they're, like, called. And so, uh, luckily, eventually, her mom would get off the drugs. She would get remarried. She got Christine. She got custody of Christine again when she's, like, 15. And then they moved from Long Island in New York to Clear Lake City, Texas, where our story takes place. So, at, at age 17, while she's attending Clear Lake High School, she meets two, these two popular girls named Rachel and Tiffany. And so, Tiffany Rowell was born on April 24, 1985. She had dreams of becoming an actress and wanted to be a social worker when she grew up. Uh, then you got the other girl named Rachel. Rachel was born on November 20th, 1984. Uh, she was known to be creative and wanted to join the Air Force. She was active in the church and even became a, a church counselor. Uh, she was interested in true crime and actually wanted to have a career eventually in law enforcement. So Rachel and Tiffany, they basically come to Christine's life. They give her this total makeover that you see in like the movies, like 2000s movies, you know, uh, the contacts, so she's not having to wear, like, these big, thick glasses. Uh, better wigs to look more natural, so, you know, she's not getting made fun of. And how to do makeup better, because apparently, according to a classmate, she apparently looked like a clown. So they basically were trying, like, ha trying to help her out. And so in 2002, she starts dating this guy named Christopher Lee Snyder. Uh, I don't have a date of birth on him, but apparently he is seven born in 1982. Apparently when he was 12, he got hit by a car, and his family says this is the point where, like, everything changed. Um, apparently he met... Christine when he was 16 and she was 14 and apparently at 16 he apparently committed a robbery in Kentucky and there was a warrant out for his arrest but he somehow fled and was in Texas. He did serve jail for a couple years but escaped and then went back to Texas and by the time he meets Christine again she's like popular like you know she got the makeover she's friends with Rachel and Tiffany the popular girls so they immediately catch up. Um, Chris, Christine would say that Chris because he was a little bit older. He was like a father figure, even though he was controlling and abusive. Because remember, her father wasn't really in her life. So, of course, their relationship was very toxic, as you can imagine. Um, they would constantly argue with each other. And Chris would have Christine put out of the house like, multiple times. Apparently, she threatened to kill his whole family. His whole family referred to her as a psycho, which means understandable. And sometime during... And apparently, she would even sit out on the ground and, like, scream, like, all night. When she, whenever she was locked out of his house. And then sometime after this, in 2003, she was but Miss Irresistible by her school. So, of course, it is the summer of 2003. Rachel and Tiffany, they're a year older than Christine. So, this is when they graduate. Christine, what well, technically was a junior, they were seniors. So, they're graduating. They're gone. They're not, they, they haven't left the city, but they're done with high school. Okay? 
So obviously they start they stop hanging out with Christine as often. Um, apparently it was because they didn't like Chris, and if Chris was coming, we might as well not invite Christine. If it's just you, you can come. You know, you are a friend. We fuck with you, but we don't fuck with Chris. And so Tiffany and Rachel wind up getting a house together, and apparently it was one of their like childhood homes, and they got a job together at the same cafe. Apparently there was like some sources that said it was like a strip club, like a titty bar, but they weren't the ones like doing like the stripping they were just like waitresses so and so somehow despite never smoking apparently a day in her life tiffany's mom would die of lung cancer when tiffany was 19. and so tiffany was dating marcus ray priscilla and apparently his cousin out Al Albert, i hope i pronounced that right nicholas sanchez would tag along sometimes and so marcus um marcus was born on august 29th 1983 and his cousin, Albert, was born on May 12, 1982. And so Marcus apparently was attending San Jahino University and had plans to get a business degree. Albert apparently, okay, sources differ. Some say he came from Houston. Others are saying he came from Chicago. But what is known, like what is confirmed is that he did come from like a, a dangerous city. So he came to Clear Lake for like a better life, to like get away from the violence and to be more than what he came from, essentially. And so he would sing for, in a local group and was planning on going to college for co computer technology. Uh, the four of them often had parties at the house because apparently it was like, t it was a, sorry, it was Tiffany's house. I just remember this. It was Tiffany's house. Christine's obviously left out because you now she's dating Chris and they were trying to do with Chris. So like, obviously Christine feels left out and apparently Chris convinces her that, you know, well, you should feel left out because they're not even inviting you. Apparently sometime around this, Chris is sentenced to, uh, Chris is sentenced to prison for a few months. Chris is sentenced to prison for a few months, and during this time, and he gets out for, like, again, robbery, as you can imagine. He gets out, and apparently he's, like, worse than he was when he went in this time. And he would take off Christine's wig and attempt to embarrass her, because, remember, she has to wear these wigs because we're alopecia. And he would do this in front of her friends, apparently multiple times, to the point to where they're like, look, you gotta leave this man. And so Marcus, allegedly, because I only said this on, like, one source, uh, they were saying Marcus did ecstasy and weed, again, allegedly, because I only said it on, like, one source, and that he may have possibly been doing some drug dealing and that Albert may have had may have had some connections to the Mexican Mafia. Again, allegedly. Uh so of course Chris and Christine, they're doing drugs. That's at least confirmed. And they're watching violent movies. And Chris would apparently would suggest getting Christine a gun and would suggest like what would it be like to kill someone. And so Tiffany's house had cash and drugs, and of course, with Chris and Christine being the um drug as they are, they're willing to get to it at any cost possible. And so on the fateful day of July 17, 2003, Rachel calls her parents basically saying that she misses them and she's considering moving back in because apparently like she's not ready for like the big girl step of like living on your own. And so the next day, July 18, 2003, um, Chris and Christine go to the house with what they would say was the intention to rob the group of what they had. And so, of course, you can imagine it's Tiffany, Rachel, Marcus, Albert, and, like, two other people. These two other people are named because they were not there, like, when the actual crime happened. Because apparently they had left, like, before Chris, Chris and Christine had got there. And so around 3 p.m. on this day, there was a friend that had called basically saying, like, hey, I'm on my way over. And Marcus had answered saying she's in the shower. She'll be out in about 30 minutes. So she calls back 30 minutes later because, you know, he said she, she should be out in 30 minutes. Nobody answers. And Rachel apparently was about to go to the mall when Chris and Christine do finally come over. Of course, imagine Chris bought a gun. Uh, they're dressed in all black and Christine is wearing a bandana. And come on, it's the middle of July in Texas. You know, it's, it's, it's hot, hot. They're in the living room. They confront the group. Chris brings the gun out. Of course, he gets serious. Christine takes Rachel apparently up, like, upstairs to like go get cash and drugs. And Chris is holding the other three at gunpoint. So, of course, uh, while Christine and Rachel are upstairs, they hear gunshots and find out that Chris has shot the other three. So, they're all wounded. Rachel, of course, tries to run away because, you know, she ain't trying to be shot either. But she is shot multiple times. And sources said apparently she was shot 12 times, but somehow was still alive. Uh, so, then they leave because they were like, everybody should, should be dead. But then Christine was like, I have a gut feeling that somebody's not dead. And while... And the time that it took for her to come back to be like, let me check, make sure everybody did because we don't know witnesses because, yeah, these people know who I am. Rachel has somehow dragged herself like to her phone and had dialed 911 and like missed, like she was about to dial the second, like the second one because remember 911, but Christine like grabbed her, uh, was about to shoot her again, I guess was 
they said the gun jammed, so obviously didn't shoot her. Decided we're gonna pistol whip her because you know what, like, she has to die. And so Chris takes her to Walmart like less than less than an hour after the murders, and this is because she had work, and apparently she was working in the beauty section. So she basically clocks in for work after committing participating in a quadruple murder. And so the unnamed friend, apparently they gave her the name Brittany. Because I guess like she didn't want to like her actual name out there. And, or maybe she was a minor. I don't know. Maybe both. So the unnamed friend, she decides to go to the house. Since, you know, I'm in the area anyway. So I might as well figure out like why ain't nobody answering the phone. And so she has her boyfriend, his cousin, and her nephew and her with her in the car. She goes to the front door. Front door's unlocked. She walks in, uh, sees the bloodbath, runs out. The boyfriend's talking to her like, why are you like freaking out? What's going on? Apparently he goes in there. He runs. He go gets a neighbor to call the police. The police show up. So, of course, the neighbor would mention how, like, these, it was, like, a male and a female, white, uh, young-looking, wearing all black in the middle of July in Texas, you know, obviously, that's gonna, like, stand out. So, of course, Christine, um, she's obviously not considered a suspect right away, because, remember, she's, like, a woman, so, like, obviously, they were thinking, like, oh, a woman could have committed this. It was not her, even though, like, that, anyway. So, yeah, uh, Christine apparently slept in her parent in her mom and stepdad's bed for, like, three days, and didn't attend any of the funerals, like any of the four funerals. And apparently, from like one or two sources, it, it says she called Chris a thousand and one times after the murder. So police decide we're gonna look at uh, phone records from all the victims for the past like 48 hours. Christine was did not make the cut, hence why that she wasn't questioned originally. And had they went back 72 hours, she would have been questioned. And there was even a picture of Christine in Rachel's bag with like, like a little note saying how like what a great friend you are, how much I love you, like you know all that. So the police learned that uh, Marcus used to do drugs, and I thought this may may have possibly been a drug deal gone wrong, because you know that happens, and sometimes in innocent people get killed when it comes to drugs. Well, friends would say he was trying to change his ways so it couldn't be drugs, and then the theory was disproved after drugs and cash were still found in the house, because it was really drugs. They would have took the cash and the drugs and. Dip. So then they looked at Rachel and they noticed that she was shot in the crotch and she had the most bruises out of air bias. They thought maybe maybe a woman had did this, like a woman had killed or this participated in the murders and it was part of sexual envy because remember she shot in the crotch, it's like a very sensitive area. So Christine goes on, has her senior year, like nothing happened, like she just have like two of her best friends murdered. And so she's able to walk off the stage. Uh she didn't have all her credits, but they said you could walk you could walk off stage with your class if you come and do like summer school so you finish your credits you actually get your diploma and she never did so i guess she technically never graduated and then sometime after she graduated she gets arrested for shoplifting so uh for some reason chris gets arrested again not for the murders but like apparently it doesn't even say what he got arrested for this time and so christine she apparently is sent to rehab as punishment and she breaks up with chris and in rehab she meets this guy named justin rod and he was a former heroin addict. And so Justin would basically have these, he basically would like con women that like had money and he would basically like use them up until like there was like pretty much nothing left. And so an example of this is he would claim to have cancer and apparently he like took a woman's credit card without her permission. And then in 2005, Christine and Justin get married. And of course, remember that insurance policy that I had? I mentioned when she was like two. Yeah, it paid out because she's like 18 now. So... It was like close to about with like I don't know what the proper word is, but apparently it it was building like it was building up more money over the years since she's had to wait so long, and so she got close to about half a million dollars, and so three hundred sixty thousand dollars was spent on a, a a condo for her and Justin because they're now married and heroin, and so Christine eventually um because she's doing these drugs she would see visions of Rachel covered in blood she of course I guess felt guilty it was telling Justin what happened. And so around this time, Chris then moved to South Carolina with a woman he'd have met over the internet. And so then on July 8th, 2006, uh, Houston police get an anonymous phone call. Uh, Houston police get a phone call about, about the quadruple murders. And they were saying that Christine was bragging about bragging about committing the murders. And they looked at the sketch again and realized that the sketch did kind of look Christine. And apparently at the time this was going on, the reward for information was like $100,000. And this was raised by Rachel's dad himself. So they... Police decided to give Christine a visit because they were like, "Why are we? Why are we ever uh, talked to her before?" And Christine, and apparently, they put uh, Christine in Chris's faces on TV as people of interest, even though they really shouldn't have suspects at this point. And Christine, like, of course, freaked out and she dipped. Like her and Justin, they dipped. So they go live in a motel room and they are caught on July eighteenth, two thousand six. 
to the three-year anniversary of the car trooper murders. Um, it said that Justin called 911, but of course, I guess I'm, like that's never confirmed because like sources say allegedly. Um, Justin was the only one who left because Christine was just too paranoid to like leave. They lived off vending machine food and heroin. There were dog feces, even though apparently they couldn't find a dog. And there was blood splatter because, you know, apparently when you do heroin, there's like blood splatter involved. And so there was like at least 50, oh, there was at least 56 needles apparently that were like ready to use at the time like they were found. And apparently they were claiming they spent at least $500 on heroin a day. And Christina allegedly injected herself with heroin every 10 to 15 minutes. So of course Christine is taking into questioning. She's going through withdrawals. Which apparently it's like very painful from what I've read. And she's taken to the hospital. She... So originally she confessed to everything, but then she tells like, hey, I've gone through withdrawals. So it takes her to the hospital. After she takes her to the hospital, she changes her story. She says, look, I was scared of Chris, so I just did what he wants, so I, so I wouldn't get killed too. And like, well, if you were so scared of him, why would you call him so many times after the murder? And so Chris's sister, so apparently he has a sister named Brandy. She apparently would claim that they came back to the house with a pillowcase full of ec ecstasy. And she would say, like, she alleged, she claims that she told him to flush and down the toilet and she saw him only dump like half down the toilet and she assumed he dumped the other half but like we already know what this man did and so of course brandy was um trying to expose the evidence because she uh, well according to her she would claim that I, she, she would claim that she thought her brother had stolen from a drug dealer and she wasn't like trying to have her brother get like killed or nothing because you know obviously like drug dealers don't play about that especially that much like that much drugs so like that's what she was saying. Um, Justin would say that Christine admitted to him that he would, she was jealous of Rachel and Tiffany. Hence, that jealousy motive kind of does like, work out. Uh, Christine is sentenced to four counts of murder. And she is sentenced to 40 years of life. Now, apparently, she was eligible. She, they were trying to file the death penalty because, you know, this is Texas. And you don't commit a quadruple murder. And the only reason she did not get quadruple murder. Sorry. The only reason she did not get the death penalty in this case is because she was a minor when she, when she committed said murders. Granted, yes, she was 17, and you can be charged as an adult, but you cannot get the death penalty because you are a minor, and that's considered unconstitutional. Uh, Chris, by this point, you probably wonder, like, where the hell Chris at? Well, Chris then killed himself by overdosing on some pills because he saw the news they were looking for his ass, and apparently his girlfriend, who was living with, he saw the news, he went to the woods with a bunch of pills, and they found him dead. And so the, apparently they find him dead on August 5th, so his, Chris is the, confirmed to have took his own life. And in 2011, M. Will M. Willop Phelps wrote a book over this case. Now, normally I don't talk about like people who wrote people who've written books about cases. Unless I personally read the book myself, but I know he is a great writer and I love his work, so I know that book is definitely really good. Um, I will leave a link down to it below. Uh, it's gonna be an Amazon link because I don't know like what else to link. So yeah, with that being said, that's the case of the Miss Irresistible Murders. I hope. You at least enjoyed the case. You maybe learned something new. Of course, sources down below as always. I guarantee you there's a good chunk of them there. And yeah, with that being said, I'll see you females in the next one. Bye. So with the play dead, will you regret everything that you did that you said? I don't think you understand what you're doing. And my heart's black and blue from the bruising. I feel like when I'm with you, I'm losing. I feel like you think that this amusing. Sitting there gaslighting and confusing. Was it me? Is it me? Am I deluded? I'm the one who's always sorry the conclusion. Even though I offer all of the solutions. I wish you loved me like I love you. It's stupid. When I'm alone with you, I never feel lucid. I wish I wasn't struck by Cupid. I wish when I first saw you, I knew this. When I'm with you, I feel so useless. I feel diluted. My heart's been wounded. Silhouettes of you are like a time. Never really know just what you want. With you, I don't ever feel calm I can feel the sweat inside my palm Play with me like cats and a string You don't understand the pain it brings You don't ever want to give me wings You don't ever want to set me free But if I lay down and I play dead and I stay dead Baby, you'll get